The arch of Severus apart, um, the reign of Septimius Severus, didn't we really see any new monumental architecture at Rome? Nothing really big. Uh, we know that he started building a bathhouse, or he's said to have built a bathhouse, but we don't know where that is. But it might actually be uh, when the Baths of Caracalla were started. Uh, we do know that he was responsible for a series of extensions to the Domus Augustania. Uh, he had two sons, he had wanted the usual extra bits and pieces. He certainly built this bathhouse at the back end of the uh, Domus Augustiana and built a whole series of brick structures along here which end up at this particular thing here. So basically everything you see here is from the time of Severus. Nothing really remarkable about it, uh, not open to the public even, uh, but there was one very remarkable structure which stood just over here, which was demolished in 1584, but we do have drawings of it. And this is known as the Septizodium Severi. Uh, this is the drawing that, that was made of it between 1532, 1536, and you can see it's got a colonnaded facade, it goes back like that. If we look at uh, another drawing, slightly later, 1575, you can see the end of the Severan additions to the Domus Augustiana over there. Um, you can get a slightly better idea of what this uh, was looked like. This is the Arch of Constantine, by the way, down here. The uh, Flavian Amphitheatre is there, and that's the valley going into the Forum, uh, Roman Forum. So you can get some idea of what the topography of Rome was like as well. Well, we're very fortunate that we have this thing called a fur, which has got nothing to do with animals. It's the abbreviation for the Formi Urbis Roma. The Formi Urbis Roma was the scale plan of Rome that was made at the time of Severus. And we don't have a lot of it. We're missing an awful lot. But we do have some bits and pieces. And we can identify this as the end of the Circus Maximus. And this is the Septidosium uh, there. It seems to have been some kind of enormous nymphaeum, a water fountain stro type structure. Uh, we can't really say, but the plan is very Eastern. It's not uh, a European type plan. Uh, but the name Septizodium uh, refers in effect to the, to the seven major planets. So it may have had some astronomical uh, significance as well. But the one monument I'm going to really talk quite a lot about today, and the textbook doesn't say a lot about this, so you've got your pens raised, your piece of the paper ready, you're going to make lots of notes about this, because this will almost certainly come up in the exam. And everybody that's not here today won't know this, will they? Da, 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 da. This is the so-called Arch of the Argentari, which is down here. It's actually a private monument. It's not a public state monument, it's a private monument that was built by a group of people known as the Argentari and the, no, the Negotiatores, the, the merchants, the money changers and the merchants who work in the Forum Boarium, which is that space there. Well, this is not so much an arch, as a monumental gateway. Here it is. It's really quite small. It marks the entrance to the Forum Boarium uh, from the Palatine Hill direction, from the Roman Forum se uh, section. Uh, it was incorporated into a church in the 7th century, which is why it was survived. And then in the Renaissance period, that, that dates back to the 7th century, in the Renaissance period, the facade was rebuilt in this particular way, and they freed up most of the arch, so we can actually see it reasonably clearly. Having said that, the problem is that the arch is surrounded by these horrible railings, which makes it almost impossible to get a decent photograph of it. We also have to take into account that the original ground level is probably about two meters lower. But we do have this photograph, and I think the, the textbook, the, the current edition of the textbook shows a photograph of the um, arch, um, similar to this one taken in the late 19th century. The bottom part is made of travertine. 
the sort of um, limestone that was found not too far from Rome. Uh, there's no decoration at all at the bottom part because this would have got damaged by people going through this particular gateway. The upper part is made of white marble. It stands just over six meters high today from the modern ground level. Uh, so originally something like eight meters, eight and a half meters high. Uh, the passageway is um, 3.3 meters wide. The decoration of the arch, well, it's, it's rather interesting. The, we can't see what's over there because that's still built into the church. But essentially we've got an inscription on one side only and as you can see, it's not really an arch, it's just a massive gateway, a, a lintel supported on these two piers. Uh, the arch does have some decoration, the marble plaques. You've got two inscribed panels inside the passageway. On the east, you've got this one, two people making a sacrifice scene there. Uh, on the west panel, you've got again one person making a sacrifice scene there. And then on the outer west panel, we have this scene here, two Roman soldiers marching a Parthian prisoner into captivity, where you can see the similarity between that and this. When we look at the arch in detail, the inscription is one of the most fascinating pieces of Roman archaeology, which tells you a lot about the dysfunctional family we know as the Severan family. And dysfunctional they certainly were. Um, there's a carving of what seems to be a genius or personification on that side. And then on the other side, what we have is this very nice carving of Hercules. But it's the inscription which is really the fascinating uh, piece of uh, information here. What we have here, an inscription in five lines. I've given you two versions of this, so I want you to see in its context, but I want you to look at the inscription as well. It's an inscription in five lines, if I, no, six lines, beg your pardon. And on the bottom, it says that this is paid for by the Argentari, and then the negotiatores, the money changers or bankers, and the merchants of the Forum Boarium, in honor of a person named on the first two lines, who's Septimius Severus. Uh, the date of the arch is between December 203 and November 204. The arch of Severus is 203 was made to commemorate um, what the Parthian victories, but Severus haven't been for 10 years in power. This is an offering by a group of people as part of the same celebrations. But when we look at the inscriptions in a bit more detail, you can start seeing, ooh, there's a lot of messy, scrunched in writing here. Well, you can see the grooves that have been made. It's quite clear that lines three, four, and five have been re-carved, they've been re-inscribed. The original lettering has been taken off and something else has been put there in its place. Well, the first two lines talk about the Emperor Septimius Severus in the year two, the Roman year 203-204. Uh, the third line talks about somebody called Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, which is the official name of Caracalla. <coughs> Caracalla, his nickname, because he wore a cloak, a cloak that was commonly called a Caracalla. But when we actually look at the inscription for Caracalla, we see that it gives a year date, which has to be after 211. Oh, what's going on here? Well, Caracalla's got a brother, hasn't he? Gaeta. They become emperors together in the year 211, and Gator is murdered on December the 26th, 211. And he suffers damnatio memoria. Suffering damnatio memoria means that his name is removed from everything. The Arch of Septimius Severus. What have we got here? One, two, three, four lines down. Well, this is all Septimius Severus's and titles. Then Marcus Aurelius, 
Um, this is the son, Caracalla, see, son of Lucius Antoninus. This is Caracalla's official name. It goes all the way along there, and they go, oh, look, something's been scratched out, and something else has been put in there. PP, the title part of Patria, which Caracalla did not have until he was emperor. So that's been altered into 11. And you can see the big area of recarving there. Well, actually, you can originally these letters had bronze letters in them. And you can just see the traces of the original bronze letters there. And what this said on line number four, and Septimius Gator, blah, 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 blah. So it's Damnatia Memoria. It's happened here in this line, and look how everything's got scrunched in. Gator's name's been taken off, Caracalla's name has been extended, and all his official titles, so we can see what's happened there. It's exactly the same thing on the Parthian Arch and anywhere else. But it's not just Gator's name which disappears from inscriptions, Gator disappears from official pictures. So the Berlin Tondo shows us a nice, chubby-looking, cheerful child. Caracalla, Gator's face is gone. When we look inside the arch of the Argentari, we find exactly the same type of thing has happened. Two figures. Now, you can recognise Septimius Severus, no problem there. You can recognise Julia Domna from her hairstyle. And you can see that Julia Domna's got oh, a sort of strange hand like that. Look at those big curves that you've got there. Oh, that's rather flat. Because originally, there was a carving of gator here. When they took the gator off, gator would have been standing roughly up to that height. Gator probably had his body stretching over here to offer the sacrifice as well. When he was taken off, they had to re-carve Julia Domna's hand and they make it look awful like that. Well, that's what happens when you suffer damnatio memoria, you're airbrushed out of the, the pictured or literally re-carved out. This, by the way, is what Gator looks like. And as you'll see, he doesn't look that much more attractive than uh, his brother. When we look on the other panel, what do we see there? Well, if we were three figures on the first panel, the Romans, being symmetrically minded, would normally have three figures on the opposing panel. As we see it now, it's a single figure who has to be Caracalla, if Gator's on the other side, but he's standing by himself. Let's look at this photograph, look. There were two more figures there, and they've been taken off as well. Well, this is where we start to look at the history books. In the year 2202, uh, Caracalla was married to a lady called Fulvia Plautila. Her name will come up in a moment. They had a daughter. They hated each other, but they had a daughter. Uh, Fulvia Plautila was the daughter of Gaius Fulvius Plautilius, who was a cousin of Severus, her first cousin once removed of Caracalla, um, and head of the Praetorian Guard. In 205, he was suspected of planning to murder Severus. So he is executed. His daughter and her daughter, Caracalla's daughter, are sent into exile. She is eventually murdered in 211, the same year as Gator. So, that's what must have been here. Matching the symmetry on the other side. Male, older male, in this case Gaius Fulvius Plautianus. Female, in this case Fulvia Plautila. Younger male, Caracalla. So it would have formed a symmetrical composition with that. Talk about dysfunctional families, eh? Whoa, whoa, going down and bumping everybody off. Well, Caracalla did claim that Gator was trying to murder him. That's quite possible. We, don't, we really don't know. 
When we come back to the inscription, now we can understand what's gone on in lines four and five. Line four starts off by talking about Julia Domna. How wonderful she is. She is the mother of the people, the mother of the Senate, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Well, it's this part that's been recarved. So it almost certainly originally said, Julia Domna, blah, 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 and Fulvia. Fulvia's name has gone off. Line five is not quite clear what might have existed there. But there's a reference in one of the um, Roman histories uh, that uh, Fulvius, the Praetorian uh, prefect, put up statues of himself everywhere and put his name on inscriptions everywhere. So the probability is that down there was the name of Fulvius as well. So what I love about the Arch of the Argentari, and this is why it's the sort of thing that could come up, as an exam question, is it tells you so many different things about Roman society. On the one hand, you've got the money makers, the money lenders, the merchants of the Forum Boarium saying, we like the emperor, we're totally in favour of the emperor and the family, we want to build a monument to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your ten years, uh, thank you for any benefits you might give us, like lower taxes or something like that. And then within two years, within one year possibly, uh -oh, got to start working away on it. First of all, they get rid of Fulvia, probably. Fulvia may have been removed a bit later, but they get rid of Fulvia's father. And then 211, after Gator is murdered, while well, he's in his mummy's arms saying, mummy, help me, help me. Yes, that's how he died. Uh, Gator disappears from the whole thing. So we've got this arch which has been altered at least twice because people have to be erased from the public memory. So you're all wondering, well, what was Caracalla really like? Was he such a nasty person? Well, we've got this lovely little statue of the baby Caracalla playing at being Hercules. Oh, look, Mummy and Daddy, I found a snake, and I'm strangling it, and I'm killing it. Uh, yes. Hmm, tells you a lot about his character. He looks quite a nice little chap. Chubby cheeks, reasonably happy. He got married, I think, at the age of 14 or 15, which was reasonably normal in Roman society. Um, in his 20s, he looked reasonably serious young man, uh, reasonably attractive, I mean, passable. Um, yeah, you can see the same type of person riding a scooter in Rome today or in Tripoli. Remember the Severan family come from what is now Libya. This is a wonderful carving room from Corinth that we're going to show that beautiful sort of Berber-like um, curly hair. But when he becomes emperor, this is what we see. <laughs> Ooh, I've got a problem. Ooh, I went to the toilet this morning. Oh, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you can't I just think the impression. You want to see some more of that then? Look at this distinctive mark here. Now, this becomes a common characteristic in all third century portraiture. It's sort of the big frown, the wrinkled forehead, the heavy cheeks, the... Mm. I'm not happy with the world. You know, this is not even an Eeyore type expression. This is, I'm really not happy with the world. I don't like anybody at all. Uh, the short hair. Now, Septimius Severus follows the fashion of the Antonine emperors. He's got the long beard. We've now gone on to short beards, short hairstyles. It's a military type hairstyle. Would you like that man to be your enemy? Not really, especially now he's an emperor of Rome. I couldn't find one that um, a photograph of the statue actually matched the reconstruction, unfortunately. But th this is the same uh, basic statue. Again, the, the hair colouring, everything else, skin colouring taken from uh, what's paint fragments still uh, visible on the statue. And I mean, I mean look at him, you know. Mm. Mm. 
Now, I've often told you I've got um, various friends who look like Roman emperors, and I do have one who looks like this, a guy called Tony Wilmot, who was voted Archaeologist of the Year for Britain last year, I think it was. But he looks exactly like this, mm, but he's a much nicer person. So, yeah, Caracalla. Well, Caracalla really didn't trust very many people. He went around executing lots of people. But Caracalla was well aware of the most important piece of information or advice any Roman emperor could have, which is, keep the people of Rome happy and you will be okay. Well, he tried to do this in many ways, but he started off by upsetting them at a very early date by introducing a new coin. The Roman finances were in a terrible state by this uh, time. The Civil War and the Severus had led to different emperors making silver coins to pay the soldiers for their support. The silver mines were mainly in Spain. There were some in Dacia, modern Romania as well. But the Spanish silver mines were running out. And without silver, what do you do? Well, what Caracalla does is he introduces a new coin called the Antoninianus. Well, we call it that. We don't know what the Roman name was. Plural Antoniniani. Uh, officially, this is equal to two of the standard silver coins, which have got a greatly reduced weight of silver in them. But in actual fact, look what happens to one of these coins after it's been in circulation for a while. It's made of copper or bronze. It's got a silver covering. And the Roman people could see this. On the plus side, we know that Caracalla uh, um, gave Roman citizenship to every freeborn person in the Roman Empire. This meant that for the first time, anybody in the Roman Empire, was, unless you were a slave, um, could call on Roman justice. Everybody came under the same legal system. It wasn't the sort of situation whereby if you were a citizen of Ankara, you left Ankara and did something in Byzantium that was perfectly legal in Ankara, but it wasn't legal in Byzantium. If you weren't a Roman citizen, you had big problems. But Roman citizens all came under Roman uh, law. On the other hand, all Roman citizens had to pay slightly higher taxes. So suddenly, the income of the Roman Empire is increased enormously because everybody is almost a Roman citizen. So that's a double thing there. But what with the new revenues that's coming in, Caracalla is now able to sort of follow that basic piece of advice that every Roman emperor was given, keep the people happy and you won't have a problem with them. So what he decides to do is to Follow the example of Nero, Augustus through Agrippa, um, Titus uh, through Nero to a certain extent, and Trajan build a bathhouse. Well, where are the big bathhouses? The bathhouse of Agrippa and the bathhouse of uh, Nero are over there. We've got the bathhouse of Titus and the bathhouse of Trajan over here. Which area doesn't really have any bathhouses? This area here between the Aventine and the Caelian Hill. And this is where Caracalla builds a bathhouse. Well, having said that, this might be the location for the Baths of Severus, which we have mentioned in a historical document, but we don't know where they are. The only bathhouse in this area is that very small one there called the Theomis Suriani. Well, Caracalla is determined to go one better than the Emperor Trajan. And as you can see in these two plans, the Baths of Caracalla are bigger. They're 300 um, by about 400 uh, metres. They follow the standard imperial type bathhouse plan. So you've got a large enclosure. You've got the hot room, the caldarium is on the south. You've got double sets of rooms. Uh, all the way down there, 
What do I do with this plan to get it back to front? I didn't realise it was back to front, but it is back to front, <laughs> actually, looking at the numbers. Um, you've got a double set of room. You can see the obvious similarities between the Baths of Trajan there, the Baths of Caracalla here. Uh, it is bigger. There are certain specific differences. So, for example, rather like with the, the Baths of uh, Trajan, Part of this had to be built out on substructures at the front to give support there. Uh, at the south end, instead of this theatre-type uh, construction, and we don't exactly know what that was in the Baths of Trajan, but in the Baths of Caracalla, you've got a running track, or rather you've got half a stadium. Remember the stadium of Domitian? We've got half a stadium here, so that people can sit there and watch the races. We've got a very large reservoir here, water reservoir to supply water to the bathhouses, and a usual collection of libraries and sort of small rooms and lecture theatres and people selling hot dogs, that sort of thing, all the way around it. One big difference is, of course, that um, Th these baths, oh I see what I did, I put it upside down to get the, the north point at the top. Uh, these baths have the bath block standing free. In the baths of Trajan, the bath block is attached to the main wall, but this sets a slightly different pattern. They are big. You can see the cars and vans parked down there, and they survive in incredibly good condition because they're brick and concrete. Uh, if you've got a building that's made of uh, marble, you can knock it down and use the marble. If you've got a building made of travertine, you can knock it down and use the travertine. But if it's brick and concrete, there's not a lot you can do with it. So you may as well leave it here. So we've got the natatio, or open air pool there. We've got a frigidarium here, tepidarium there, caldarium there. Exercise halls here and here, uh, enormous statues found in both of those there, and that big parade ground outside with, as I said, the stadium and the reservoir on that side there. Standard plan, Natatio, open air swimming pool. Frigidarium, the cold room. Tepidarium, room of medium heat where you get yourself ready to go into the caldarium, the hot sweating room, there are dry sweating rooms on either side and other various features as well, and of course the gymnasium. Well the plan doesn't really give you any impression of the size of this. We're talking about buildings with ceilings 30 to 40 metres above present ground level. This is the Frigidarium uh, in the uh, Baths of Caracalla, uh, another shot shown one side of it. Uh, a group of Americans visiting Rome in the 19th century were so impressed by this structure that when they decided to build, get together and build a railway station in New York, the waiting room was built exactly on the model of the Baths of Caracalla. Well, you can see what it looked like, New York City, Penn Station. Um, Grand Central Station is a bit smaller, it's the same type of idea, but this was exactly uh, scale to scale, copy of the Frigidarium in uh, the Baths of Caracalla, and idiotically it was knocked down in the 1960s, and everybody's always regretted it since then, which is why uh, Central Station still stands. To get some idea of what that would have been like, you would really have to go to Washington DC. Uh, the Union Station there is broadly modelled on the Baths of Caracalla, but with a much lower ceiling. But you get some idea of what the magnificence of this building would have looked like. Again, we're looking at the waiting room area there. Well, that's the structure over here. Um, again, have we got anything to give you any idea of size here? Well, you can see the Roman, Roman traffic jam over there. Uh, Frigidarium, Tepidarium, but the real incredible structure was the Caldarium here. It's 35 metres in diameter. It had a full dome, a full half dome, supported on eight piers. 
Two of them still stand, coming up to just short of 40 metres high. Uh, between each of the piers was a large window. This is an astounding piece of concrete architecture. Uh, the Pantheon is astounding. Well, this, this is slightly smaller than the Pantheon, a little bit bigger than the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which is 34 metres. This is 35 metres. Uh, what made it possible to put a dome on these very narrow pillars with these big windows in between was that for the dome they used broken pottery, amphorae, which are empty. Empty amphorae, they're strong, they put up a lot of volume, but they're light. So that's what made it possible to build that particular dome there. Well, the, the baths, as you might expect, were incredibly uh, well decorated and a lot of the decoration is still to be seen here. We're missing, obviously, the marble uh, from the walls of the different rooms, but we've still got quite a lot of uh, very elaborate mosaic pavements. Some rooms have marble flooring, which is definitely gone now. A lot of black and white mosaic, which is fairly common in most bathhouses, but black and white mosaic that would have been on the ceiling, not uh, on the walls or the floor. Also, some incredible pieces of statuary. This, for example, is the one we know as the Farnese Bull. It is the largest single surviving piece of sculpture from the classical period. It's a single block of marble. It's just about four meters high. It has been restored. Uh, we call it the Farnese Bull um, because it belonged to the Farnese family. Well, this represents the story of um, the myth of Dirke, um, the mother who was killed by her sons because she was unfaithful to their father. And we have two of the sons here, there are three sons all together. They tie her um, or make her lie on the ground and they get the bull to jump on her and that's the end of her. We know from Pliny the Elder that on the Avertine Hill there was a house in the Republican period and the early imperial period in which there was a statue showing this by Apollonius of Tralles and his brother, brother Tauriscus, uh, Tauriscus uh, both from Rhodes. And this was made in the second century BC. Uh, the probability is, is that this is the original. There's a lot of argument about it. You can't date it, of course. Um, you can tell where it comes from, but you can't date it. Uh, the, the style is Hellenistic Baroque, but of course Hellenistic Baroque is being copied in Rome at a later date. It's doubtful if Hellenistic Baroque could have been this well copied in the third century, and this is the biggest single piece of marble sculpture we've got from the classical period. So the probability is that this actually was, it is the original uh, statue. We also have this one, which is uh, 3.9 meters high, it's a little bit smaller, single statue, the Farnese Hercules also known as the Weary Hercules. Uh, this statue has been admired ever since it was dug up in the 16th century. This uh, engraving was made by a Dutch scholar who visited Rome at that time. Here we see the actual statue. This is a Roman period copy in marble of a bronze original by Lysippius in the 4th century BC. So, you know, we, we, this fits into that normal pattern of uh, Romans copying uh, earlier works. Um, it probably late Republican, early Imperial Roman in date. It's been brought from somewhere else to decorate the bust of Caracalla. And just to give you a better idea of size, we're missing the, the head, the arms and the feet of this. It's identified as Hercules. It sits in a museum called the Belvedere. Uh, this is first reported in the year, I think, 1404. So it's not exactly certain where it comes from. It's thought to have come uh, from the Baths of Caracalla, but we can't be 100% certain. Uh, this is uh, actually signed 
um, by the sculpture, uh, by the sculptor, and there's a man called Gliptek. And the general uh, feeling is that this was specifically made for the baths. But there's no certainty about that. We really can't be certain. But at least you can get some idea of the massive size of uh, you know, these particular statues in the baths of Caracalla. Well, Caracalla wasn't exactly a happy person, and although the Roman people liked him quite a lot, um, no, he had a rather bad reputation, bumping off his relatives, everybody he could, killing his own daughter. Hey, come on, can't be a nice guy. Uh, before his bathhouse was completed, he started a war with Parthia, you know, become rich and become famous. And we know that in the year 217, while he was at a place called Edessa, Shandla Urfa, he decided to go and visit a very famous temple at a place called Kahi, Haran, on the border between Turkey and Syria. And on the way back, he got off his horse to go to the toilet behind a bush and didn't come out alive. He was killed by one of his bodyguards, and the other bodyguards killed him in turn. The person who probably arranged all this was Macrinus, who was the Praetorian prefect who then sort of tries to finish off the war with Parthia. Uh, he agrees to surrender Nisibis, just the other side of the border from modern Nisibin. Uh, and then comes the most remarkable thing that you could possibly imagine. The, the news that Macrinus is now emperor and Caracalla is dead doesn't go down particularly well with Caracalla's relatives. He still has relatives living in Edessa. Uh, in Amessa, sorry, in Homs. And they now make the amazing claim that Avitus, the son of Caracalla's aunt, is actually the son of Caracalla. He's the grandson, anyway, of Septimius Severus. So the Roman army decides we've got to support a real member of the family. So Macrinus dies in battle not far from Kinet Hoyuk, and this guy becomes emperor. 14 years old, 14 and a bit years old. He's the high priest of a local god called El Al-Jabal. El Al-Jabal, El Al-Jabal, the god of the mountain. That name is Latinized as Elagabalus. We know him as Elagabalus. He tries to impose the worship of Elagabalus on the Roman people. They're not particularly keen on this idea. But then he starts acting in a way that really upsets the Roman people. To begin with, he builds a big temple to his god right next door to the temple of Venus and Roma. Then, before he's 18, he's got married and divorced five times. He's alleged to have prostituted himself in the imperial palace. Any one of the servants could buy his services. He was overheard to say publicly, oh, I wish I could have an operation and become a woman. Well, this didn't go down too well with the Roman people. So his, his grandmother, the sister of Julia Domna, the wife of um, Septimius Severus, says, look, you know, something could happen. Why don't you adopt somebody as a son just in case something happens to you? So he says, OK, Granny. And he does this, he adopts his cousin, Severus Alexander. And six months later, he's dead. And Severus Alexander becomes emperor of Rome at the age of 13 years and six months. At first, his reign is pretty okay. His mother and his grandmother look after the control of the Roman Empire until the year 222. Uh, sorry, 227 when he's 18, so he can become emperor in his own right. That same year, the Persians, now ruled by the Sasanians, not the Parthians, start attacking Rome. So he says, right, I've got to be a soldier. Off he goes with his short military haircut. Many statues of him like this show him in his armour as an imperator, dealing with the problems on the eastern frontier. 
233, he agrees a peace. But the problem was, to defeat the Sasanians, he had to take soldiers from Germany. And the Germans start attacking across the Rhine, so he goes rushing all the way back to Europe. He gets to the Rhine and he asks his best general, Maximilus Thrax, let's get an army together. Maximilus Thrax does this, and then 235 says, no, I'm sick of war. I have seen too much war. I would rather buy peace from the Germans than anything else. They take one look at him, he's dead. And Maximinus Thrax <laughs> becomes emperor. This is the guy who starts off the period we know as the third century crisis. A 50 year period, 49 years to be exact. Uh, no, it is 50 years exactly of uh, civil war, external attacks, deflation, inflation, roughly 23 legal emperors of Rome, about 26 emperors of bits and pieces of the Roman Empire. But that's a story which we'll leave until the next class. There you are. Okay, we went through a lot today, and don't tell everybody about the arch of the Argentari. Ooh, we want the art of the Argentari.